Stripping down science. The Naked Scientists. How can neutrons probe the properties of materials? It's Sunday the 25th of November and this week we'll investigate ISIS, the neutron and muon source. I'm Ben Valsler and this week I'm joined by Dave Ansell. Hello. Coming up we'll find out how the neutrons can be used to see atomic structure of materials as well as understand their magnetic and physical properties. And in the news we'll hear how a new technique can allow us to print perfect replacement cartilage. The Naked Scientist podcast is powered by UK Fast, the UK's best hosting provider. On the web at ukfast.co.uk. Chris Smith is in Australia this week, so we thought we would take the opportunity to take you on our own little outing, and we're going to go to the ISIS neutron and muon source in Abingdon in Oxfordshire. Still to come, we'll be finding out how ISIS can help to build better electronics and even to develop new antibiotics. If you'd like to get in touch with us with any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. You can tweet at Naked Scientists, comment at facebook.com slash Naked Scientists or email chris at thenakedscientist.com. Now, ISIS is a centre for neutron and muon science based in Oxfordshire and run by the Science and Technology Facilities Council. It's used for a vast range of different research, as any scientist who has a good enough application can use the facility for free. To find out more about ISIS itself, I went to visit Martin Bull, who took me on a little tour. Right now, uh, we're standing in the the middle of uh, Target Station 1, we call things target stations here because that's where we make neutrons, uh, which we use like beams of light to investigate the structure of materials. Neutrons are pretty common. Each person listening to the radio now is made of half neutrons, but they're locked away inside the nucleus, the center of the atom. And so we need to release them to do our experiments. So what we have is a high power accelerator that fires a bunch of protons, which are about the same mass as a neutron and that knocks them out of the metal target we've got which is tungsten and then you have a big cloud of neutrons that you can send to experiments to work with. So this structure that we're standing in front of it's pretty big and in the centre is a big bunker as high as a house and uh, probably several houses wide and connecting to that is a, a long tunnel made of big blocks of steel and concrete and down that tunnel whistle the protons as they're on their way to smash into the target. And the target is living inside the big bunker in the middle of the hall. And we need all the shielding just to make sure that the proton beam doesn't get out. Then the neutrons are emerging from small holes in the the big bunker into instruments which are clustered around them. So it's a little village of experiments. And each, uh, we have about 20 of these experimental areas clustered around this target. Each of these can operate independently of the others. So we're doing 20 different scientific experiments at any one time. So your accelerated protons speed their way down a beam line, slam into a bit of tungsten, that liberates a whole load of neutrons. What sort of quantities are we looking at? So we've optimised the way uh, we create neutrons. Firstly, the protons are travelling about 84% of the speed of light, so that delivers um, a lot of energy into the target, and each proton in the bunch is able to cause around 20 neutrons to be released, so so that gives a bit of a multiplication. But we're still quite faint compared to what you might get out of a modern synchrotron X-ray source, so we have to use our neutrons very carefully. The protons hit your tungsten target with a great deal of energy and scatter neutrons everywhere. How do you control them to actually corral them and get them to go past your sample rather than just out into these enormous concrete walls we can see? So uh, herding neutrons is a delicate art. So they have no electrical charge, which means you can't use any of the normal tricks with electric fields or magnetic fields. But instead we can use their properties to reflect them off mirrors or crystals. So you can actually shape and control a beam in in, in slightly different ways to what you might do with a charged particle, but still very, very flexible. So is it just a simpler case of putting whatever it is you want to look at in the way of the neutrons and then seeing what happens? Uh, it is pretty straightforward, yeah. You, uh, we have, you have a hole, uh, you, do, you lower your uh, experiment down in the hole so it is inside the beam of neutrons 
and the neutrons then scatter and you collect them in a big detector. So it's a bit like uh, having a, an ordinary camera on your mobile phone, but instead of using light, you're scattering off. You know, your friend, you have an experiment and you're scattering neutrons off. So it's a, you could think of it, neutrons, you could just swap for light. And what we have here are very powerful neutron cameras that are able to image the molecular world. The neutron source is used to look at the uh, structure of materials. We like to say that we can see where atoms are and also what they're doing, so how they're vibrating and, and rotating and joined to each other. And unlike uh, a large accelerator like the Large Hadron Collider, which is interested in the very basic makeup of the universe, we're looking at a whole range of science that affects everyday life. So we're looking at materials that you might commonly find in, in products around the home or in cars or in power plants. And we're trying to understand how the atomic structure, so where the atoms are located and how they're joined together, how that affects our real world experience of them and allows us to either change them to have different properties or to invent new materials that will solve problems that we're interested in. What sorts of things can we actually learn about that material? The basic um, experiments we're doing here is looking primarily at the structure of materials. So we're, we're finding out how in all sorts of different materials such as uh, hydrogen absorbing sponges for powering cars on hydrogen instead of petrol or looking at the structure of fibres made by spiders. We're looking at the individual atomic structure and trying to understand how that is linked to properties that you experience. So what you get out is a sort of a, a funny picture which you can interpret and determine the actual spacing between layers of atoms, which is quite phenomenal. So we have an enormous machine here that's the size of about 33 football fields and it allows you to see something that's about 100,000 times thinner than your hair. So it's an incredible machine. And it allows us to do an enormous range of science from, from engineering through physics, chemistry, out into the sort of uh, more unusual areas such as biophysics and, and archaeology. So is it just imaging that you're doing, seeing where each atom is? Or are you also learning things about the properties, about their magnetic fields, about the way that different atoms interact? We are actually looking at, um, so as well as the structure, and you can treat your sample with different temperatures and pressures and magnetic fields. Um, so that will tell you how it reacts to, to the conditions it might experience. But also, as well as measuring the structure, we're actually able to measure how atoms are bonded together. So this gives you access to all sorts of different information, such as how a polymer, long polymer chain might be flexing and, and parts of it rotating, and how that affects the properties. It might also be looking at the magnetism of a material. So take iron as an example. If you take that down to its atomic structure, every atom of iron behaves like a little magnet. Neutrons are actually also able to sense the magnetism, and that gives you a whole unique insight into how they're working, something you can't really do very well with many other techniques. So when you combine being able to measure the structure with also the motion and the magnetic information that can also come out, then you have a really very, very powerful tool. Looking at other imaging techniques, there's usually a compromise somewhere. Electron microscopes are fantastic, but you need to very carefully control the material that you put in in the first place. And the diamond synchrotron, which is just a few metres away really, is a very powerful x-ray source but you quite often vaporise the things that you put in. How do you need to prepare a sample to go into a neutron source? Uh, yeah, neutrons, um, by having no electrical charge, um, are actually a nice delicate way to measure things. So you mentioned the diamond light source and that's the x-rays it produces are you know, an extremely powerful and successful way of measuring materials. However, some very delicate samples, such as protein crystals, can suffer damage from the X-ray beam. That's where you might start to be interested in using a neutron technique, is when you want to uh, look at a slightly different way of seeing the material. And so because the neutron has no electrical charge, it doesn't cause any damage, and it's also very penetrating. So you can see right inside things that you wouldn't normally be able to see into, say a, a piece of aircraft turbine with an X-ray beam you might struggle to see right the way through it, but with a neutron beam, that's pretty simple to do. That was Dr Martin Bull showing me around the ISIS facility. 
Now, ISIS can be used for a huge range of science, and later in the show we'll hear how it's being used for understanding biological systems and protecting electronic components. But we're joined in the studio today by Professor Martin Dove from the School of Physics and Astronomy at Queen Mary University of London. He uses ISIS in his current position and in his previous life as Professor of Computational Mineral Physics in the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of Cambridge. Martin, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, We'll get on to how you use ISIS in a moment. But first of all, generally, how do scientists get access to ISIS? How do they apply? So every half year, uh, you will write a little proposal. Then it gets assessed by a panel, panel of your peers, so the standard peer review. That happens every, as every half year. And then if you're successful, you get scheduled. So is there a sort of quota that we must do this much materials, this much biology, this much basic physics, or is it just that the strongest applications win out? Well, it's always that the strongest win out. But, the, you know, this is a type of science where people will come along and do shortish experiments, two, three, four days, and there are enough ex- instruments and enough running time that actually you get the mixture more or less quite naturally, I think. As Martin Bull was saying, there's a sort of village of different yeah, instruments around, right, which means yeah. you can do lots of different experiments right. and at, all different, at the same time. Yeah, and they're all different types of experiments. Some of them are to look at specifically at structure. Some of them are to look at the way atoms move around, and some of them are a mixture. So what is it that you currently use ISIS for in your, your present position at QMUL? Well, our, our big interest is in how the properties of materials are determined by the two aspects that Martin talked about, where the atoms are, and how they move around, and we do different sorts of experiments on that. Some of the experiments we do are focused mostly on the structure, in which case you you fire the neutrons in and you measure where they come off, and uh, you then fit a very simple model of the structure. Sometimes you actually do what is called spectroscopy, where the neutrons come in and they bounce off with a change in energy, and that change in energy is telling you about the energy of the vibrations inside the material. The other type of experiment which we've we've done really quite a lot of lately is where you attempt to get a snapshot a series of snapshots of where the atoms are at any point in time and there you pick up both where they are on average but actually how they fluctuate as well how the atoms are bouncing around and you see both in the same same picture and one one of the things that we're trying to then do is build atomic models that are then consistent with the data and that tells us a lot about the the way that the atoms are moving around and how particularly the structure departs from its sort of average structure and that very often tells you something about the way the material behaves. So the answers that we're looking for are to do with the structure and also the dynamics That's of right, it. That's right, yeah. How do we then use those answers to actually tell us something meaningful about the physics of it or or at a a macro scale as it were well in the end macroscopic properties of materials are determined exactly by what goes on at an atomic scale so if you look at something like i mean the range of examples memory devices uh, where you clearly have a, a, a macroscopic magnetism but that is due entirely to what the atoms are doing batteries are another example that we've been been working with a group in chemistry here Batteries consist of, of an electrolyte material and then things move through them and you have the end uh, electrodes. And quite what, where the atoms are going in all that process, again, is something to do with uh, something that neutrons will tell us about and where the atoms are going will determine what the battery properties are. So you're able to look at combinations of materials as well, as well as trying to probe, let's say, one homogenous material to understand how that works. In a battery, for example, obviously you've got more than one material. Can you look at the interfaces, look at the interactions? Yeah, I mean, of course, this is where you start to get into a more challenging regime because most experiments, when they were originally devised as an instrument, say, would have been thinking about a homogenous sample, but actually increasingly a lot of the challenges are to do with interfaces. What sorts of things can ISIS show you that you wouldn't be able to get from, let's say, an electron microscope? We know that electron microscopes can, can tell you where the atoms are. So what is it that ISIS gives you that's extra to that? OK, so you take something like uh, beams of electrons or you take something like beams of X-rays and then you take something like beams of neutrons they're all looking at something that is fundamentally different in the material. The neutron itself is scattering off of the atomic nucleus, whereas X-rays and electrons are interacting with the electrons. So you're picking up a rather different, a different picture. Some materials look invisible 
to to x-rays and looking visible to electrons some some atoms so hydrogen for example is very difficult to see with x-rays actually it really is very visible with neutrons and so you're getting a different view of of, of the different atoms so it gives you sort of complementary science to the yes, other absolutely. other science that we're doing. Yeah. And what sorts of materials have you actually been looking at? You mentioned to me in a previous conversation about some very odd materials with properties that we just don't expect. Yeah, and usually most materials, when you heat them up, will expand. But there are a whole class of materials that we're beginning to uncover that do exactly the opposite. They shrink when you heat them up. You know, it's kind of completely the opposite to the way you'd expect things to be. That we also think the same materials do something equally odd, which is that when you squash them, they get softer. Most materials, when you squash them, you kind of imagine compacting them, it gets harder and harder, but there are some materials that appear to get softer when you squash them. We think they're actually the same material. We did, a, did an experiment very recently, only a matter of a few weeks ago, to observe this directly. And we, 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 the material actually is a zinc cyanide, we were able at ISIS to put it into a high-pressure device. And that was fantastic because uh, the neutrons are able to see the sample and not see see very much of the pressure device. They're able to pass through all the stuff that makes the high pressure. You get the signal out. And uh, we spent uh, four days, 24 hours a day, constantly changing the temperature and the pressure until we uh, got out a picture that showed just how this was behaving. And particularly we're interested in how this was affected by temperature, this effect. And how do we think it's working? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not slight. It's not really a complicated picture, but it's a rather visual picture. If you think of three atoms in in a straight line, so A, B, and C, and then the one in the middle might usually be an oxygen, something like that. If it uh, rattles up and down at right angles to to this line of atoms, and if that bond of that middle one with the other two atoms is stiff, that one going up and down. Uh, will want the other at- the other bonds to to stay f- at a fixed length, and by moving up and down, it pulls the others in, and that's kind of <laughs> the way it works. It's a very visual picture, though. <laughs> so it actually sort of pulls them in as if it they're on springs. As it's, it were. it's well, they're, it's like they were rods. It's like the bonds are very stiff rods, but the but the one in the middle is able to flex up and down. So we're able to to probe some very unusual properties. Thank you very much, Martin. Now, that is Professor Martin Dove from Queen Mary University of London. Martin will be with us for the rest of the show, so if you have any questions for him or for us, then get in touch. Tweet at Naked Scientists, comment at facebook.com slash naked scientists, or email chris at thenakedscientist.com. Still to come, we will find out how ISIS can help to design longer-lasting electronic components and can investigate interactions between bacteria. But now, Ben, what have you seen in the science news this week? Well, this week I've seen research that shows that general health checks are generally unhelpful. This is a systematic review of research into general health checks, and it shows that although they increase the number of diagnoses, they do not, in fact, reduce the number of deaths from cardiovascular or cancer diseases. Now, routine health checks, these are uh, testing healthy people for indicators of a range of conditions. They are common elements of healthcare in certain countries. And the idea is that by checking regularly for risk factors such as high blood pressure or high cholesterol, we should be able to reduce morbidity, we should be able to prolong people's lives. Now, that seems a very worthwhile aim, I'm sure you'll agree. And uh, intuitively, it feels like health checks should be a good thing. Yeah, you'd have thought that if you find a problem, you ought to be able to do something to fix it. And therefore you'd think that as soon as you can diagnose something, you're going to improve lives. That's very true. But as we discussed with regards to breast cancer screening a few weeks ago, there is a risk of what's called overdiagnosis, And that is finding evidence of a condition that would never have actually become a problem and therefore potentially recommending unnecessary, possibly invasive treatment for it. And little research has actually been done to see if health checks actually achieve the aims that they set out. So now a team at the Nordic Cochrane Centre in Copenhagen, led by Dr Lassie Krogsball, combined data from 14 separate studies into a huge meta-analysis to examine the pros and cons of health checks. 
And they published their results in the British Medical Journal and they looked at mortality, morbidity, the number of diagnoses, number of hospital admissions, referrals to specialists and quite a wide range of other factors that included things like general health, including self-reported health and how much people worried about their health, how often they were absent from work. And they used all of these to compare screened populations with populations that received no health checks. And they used studies that had between 4 and 22 years of follow-up. They did find that the results did vary between the studies, but they found no evidence in the health-checked group for a reduction of either total deaths or deaths through cardiovascular disease or cancer. They did, of course, find evidence of an increase in diagnosis, but because this didn't lead to a change in mortality, we're sort of forced to assume that some of these are, in fact, the over-diagnoses that that we didn't need to find in the first place. So what does that then say for general health checks? Well, the authors argue that they appeal to people who perhaps need them less anyway. So if you're offered one, if you're the sort of person who's health conscious, you're more likely to say yes. And they point out as well that doctors are already very good at screening patients where they think it's needed. So it could well be that without the health checks, they're spotting these things regardless. And so they conclude that health checks do not work as intended. And also in the BMJ, a related editorial piece, Domhol McCauley suggests that policy should be based on evidence of well-being rather than on well-meant good intentions. So it certainly gives us something to think about. Is the problem that the interventions aren't working or that just they're not doing the right tests to find anything which you wouldn't have picked up by just feeling ill and going to the doctor? Well, at this scale, it's really hard to tease out an individual problem. And they do suggest that we now need to look at individual screening programmes to work out what what might be going on. But I think really it's just showing that this broad sweep approach of checking over healthy people isn't doing what we want it to do. In an individual basis, it may well find something and save lives. There's no doubt about that. But at the same time, there will be enough people where it's finding something that would never have had an effect that that probably balances out. Fair enough. Now, on a slightly different subject, Norwegian scientists are looking at turning fish farm waste into cash. Intensive salmon and trout farms have revolutionised the supply of just certainly salmon, uh, making it accessible to far more people than ever before. I know I couldn't have afforded it beforehand. They do have some serious problems. Many of these are caused by the prodigious amounts of food the salmon are eating. This contains a large amount of nutrients, both in the form of energy and in the form of nitrogen and phosphorus, which can act as fertilisers. Some of these end up making up the salmon, but most are either missed by the salmon and pass straight through, or they pass straight through the salmon, and these can then cause algal blooms and seriously alter the balance of the ecosystem. Kaijel Raitan from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology is working on the old adage, where there's muck, there's brass, and essentially considering these inputs as a resource rather than a problem. Only about 30% of the fish food is used by the salmon and the rest is just kind of released into the water. So the trick is to find something which will eat this food and turn it into something useful. Filter feeders are nature's answer to this. And so if you surround fish farms with mussel beds, you could transform all this excess food into mussels, which people then can then go and eat on in their dinners. And he's found that from all the waste fish farm uh, in Norway, it increases the rate of growth of mussels and it could produce fifteen to 20,000 extra tonnes of mussels mussels which has got to be tasty this still leaves the nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers um, which are coming out the back of the salmon and the mussels won't do a lot to it they'll eat it a bit but they won't actually deal with it these are good for fertilizing plant growth so you want to find some plants to grow with it and small algae cause great problems they choke off the whole ecosystem if you use large algae like seaweed such as kelp they can clean the water absorb this nitrogen and phosphorus and also they can be collected as biofuel and just in Norway, they rec- he reckons the potential to grow 0.6 to 1.7 million tonnes of kelp, which you can then rot down and produce methane and produce electricity. So he's estimating that based on the amount of nutrient we're already putting in. That's not a, a best-case scenario. That's a current scenario. That's essentially just taking what you're throwing in the water into the fish farms and attempting to do something useful with it rather than just letting it cause pollution. And I really like this kind of approach because it's kind of taking the problem and turning it into an opportunity in a really elegant way. I guess the only problem would be that you're creating an artificial e- ecosystem, aren't you? And it may be that although you, you're obviously adding the nutrient in the first place and then getting something else to mop it up, it could be that in nature it would have been mopped up by 
five, ten different systems. And so by doing this, we're sort of creating a monoculture of, of kelp around our farms. I, mean, I guess it really depends on whether the natural solution to the problem is going to be more or less interesting to the artificial kelp-based solution. If the, if the nature just can't cope and it's just going to cause a kind of polluted desert around the place, whereas instead you can have a load of um, kelp farms with lots of fish in them, that's probably an improvement. And I assume that over time, of course, these things will settle in and become more like a natural ecosystem and support a greater biodiversity anyway. And also they'll probably reduce the fishermen won't be allowed in the kelp farms because they'll um, trawl up all the kelp. So you'll have little essentially uh, um, automatic marine reserves around your kelp farms. Excellent. If you'd like to find out more about marine protected reserves, well, actually, that's what we're talking about next week on The Naked Scientist. Helen Scales will be here with Kat Arney talking about how we can protect our marine environments. And also in the news this week, researchers at the Wake Forest Institute of Regenerative Medicine have devised a new way to print out replacement cartilage in three dimensions, and they've demonstrated that it works in a real animal. To find out more, we are joined by Dr Anthony Atala, who is the director of the Wake Forest Institute, and Anthony, thank you ever so much for joining us. Good to be with you. So why do we need to be thinking about printing artificial cartilage? Well, you know, we've actually been working on creating cartilage for quite a number of years. There's a major need for cartilage, of course, for patients who suffer from conditions such as knee problems or problems with their joints. So having available source of cartilage would be a good thing uh, for patients in the future. What do we do at the moment when we need to make artificial cartilage or when we need cartilage for a patient? What are our options? Well, there are not many options right now in terms of actually putting cartilage in place. You know, once the cartilage wears out, it's very hard to actually put anything in there that would do a good job. So, you know, surgery is done, but really there's nothing better than real cartilage. Of course, you, for example, if you have a an accident where you have a a hip uh, fracture, you know, you're, you're putting in metal pieces in place instead of putting a real, what we call elastic cartilage in place. So what's been the basis of your work? What have you been doing? We basically have been uh, uh, focusing on creating tissues and organs using the patient's own cells. The concept is actually quite simple. We take a very small piece of tissue from the patient, less than half the size of a postage stamp, And we then are able to expand those cells outside the body, and we then can start creating new cartilage tissue that could be implanted into patients in the future. And this tissue that you're you're growing outside the body, does it have all of the right properties? Well, that is one of the, the things that we're working on, is to make sure that they have the right properties. And that is where the, the bioprinting comes in, because you can actually lay down cells exactly where they need to be in a predisposed manner where you can actually program uh, a printer to do so. Now, we've been hearing a lot about 3D printing recently. It does seem to be the future, but 3D printing of living tissue seems quite remarkable. Does it work in the same way whereby you have a, a sort of inkjet head full of a cell culture and you just literally lay down the cells where you want them? That's exactly right. If you can picture your typical desktop inkjet printer, it really is utilizing very similar technology. But instead of using ink, we're using cells. You have a printer that goes back and forth, and what we do is we we modified printer so that they would print one layer at a time. So instead of having a sheet of paper coming through one at a time, imagine printing on the same sheet of paper over and over again and just building up over the same area and to make the three-dimensional tissue that you need. And do you need a a scaffold on which these cells can grow, or or can you literally just print them into three dimensions and they'll hold their shape? No, you do need a scaffold, actually. That's a good question. Uh, And we use different materials as scaffolds. We use gels that look like gelatin, if you will. Then they will hold the cells together in their shape, and these gels can then harden to different consistencies as needed. And then we can also use fibers to print. And uh, in fact, we have been able to use a combination of both gels and fibers for our printing technology. So when you've done this, how well did the cells survive? And and how well did they actually work when you did the mechanical tests that imitate what a a real bit of cartilage is likely to go through? Yeah, the, the cells survive nicely. In fact, what we do is 
we actually are using the same technology that uh, you are familiar with with an inkjet printer. What happens is you have little air bubbles that get formed inside the cartridge. You have little air bubbles that get formed, and the cells get incorporated within those bubbles, and then are they're basically then released uh, without heat affecting the cells. So the cells come down through the inkjet printer, through the print hit, uh, without being damaged. And then we're able to lay them down one layer at a time until they're able to form what they need to in terms of creating tissue with the uh, properties which are very similar to those in patients. And do we think that in the future this is a likelihood that we'll be able to just scan a knee, for example, and say, well, we need this exact 3D structure of cartilage, let's print one out and then surgically pop it in? Yes, that's in fact uh, the direction that we're headed. We are actually building printers that have scanners in them. So what you do is if you have the injured area, you actually scan the area. And with the same piece of machinery, we will then to go back and lay down the cells where they're needed in their correct three-dimensional uh, three-dimensional structure. Fantastic. Well, that does certainly sound like surgery of the future. Thank you very much, Anthony. That's Dr. Anthony Atala from the Wake Forest Institute of Regenerative Medicine. You can find the paper that we were just talking about in the journal Bioinformatics, or as always, you can find more of all of our news on our website at thenakedscientists.com slash news. Time now for this week's instalment from Planet Earth Online. DNA, life's genetic code, can be found tightly packaged inside chromosomes. At the end of these chromosomes are specialised bits of DNA called telomeres, which often associate with ageing. Birds are known for their long lives. Petrels, for instance, can live for up to 40 or 50 years. But by studying Australian zebra finches, whose average life expectancy is around five years, researchers can examine the relationship between telomeres and longevity. Planet Earth podcast presenter Sue Nelson met up with Pat Monaghan, Professor of Animal Ecology at the University of Glasgow, to find out more, as Pat studies the length of these telomeres in birds. You can think of the telomeres as a bit like the little plastic caps that you get on the ends of shoelaces. Also, if you are tying your shoelaces in the dark, you know, you can feel the plastic caps. Now, these telomeres do the same kind of job inside a cell. They identify the chromosome ends and they also protect the DNA from a number of processes that cause the ends to, in effect, fray, if you like. Apart from the protection aspect of what they do, they're often associated with ageing, though, as well. Why? Yes, they are. And one of the reasons is that every time the cell divides, the telomere gets a little bit shorter. Eventually, it will get so short that it doesn't work anymore, that then the whole genome becomes unstable and the cell doesn't function anymore and it enters a state of what's called replicative senescence. That just means it can't divide anymore. Sometimes the cell dies, sometimes it stays there but it's not quite working in the same way. So the loss of telomeres is associated with an age-related decline in tissue function. Pat examines what factors are involved in the loss of telomeres, be it environment or stresses such as a change in the availability of food for zebra finches. She also led a UK team that tracked a group of these birds, measuring their telomere length from when they were young until they died of natural causes. And earlier this year, they discovered a correlation between length of telomeres and the longevity of a bird. The best predictor of lifespan was that very first measurement of telomere length in early life. Is this also as a result of when environment kicks in and when these other external stresses possibly affect your lifestyle in much the way with, with human beings as well? Yes, there is a lot of work on telomeres in human beings and I'm afraid that almost all the things that we know are bad for us are also bad for telomere length, so smoking, stress are associated with reduced telomere length. However, when it comes to early life telomere length, we still don't really know to what extent growth conditions are influencing telomere loss or whether the variation that we see is largely a consequence of inherited factors. So work's ongoing then with with a whole range of factors? Yes, we're doing a, a number of different projects looking at different environmental conditions in the wild, animals born in different years, in different situations, in different brood sizes 
And then also we're looking at the within individual changes using the zebrafins. There were a lot of suggestions when the, the, your research came out of the sort of possible connection to human ageing and all, it almost being that in this case, when it comes to how long we live, size of telomeres does matter. One of the really interesting things, though, is that animals can restore telomere length. Now, in normal body cells, that's a very risky thing to do because if you keep restoring telomeres, you run the risk that a cell can divide uncontrollably. And, of course, that happens during cancer. It's thought that one of the reasons we don't have, for example, in our in human body cells, we don't have telomerase usually active, is it's a protective process. It keeps a check on cell division. However, in some much shorter-lived animals, they do have telomerase active in their tissues. So, yes, the basic processes are relevant to humans. People haven't done the kinds of studies that we have done in the zebra finch in humans. That's to say, tracking telomere length in the same individuals from early in life until they die. The question about should we all run along and get our telomeres measured and say, OK, that predicts how long I'm going to live. Telomeres aren't everything. There are other things that go on. So it's a very active area of biology, but I wouldn't waste your money on running out and getting your telomere length <laughs> measured because it's only going to make you either happy or miserable, but it scientifically isn't going to tell you exactly how long you're going to live. Good advice there from the University of Glasgow's Pat Monaghan, and a longer version of that interview can be heard at the current edition of the Planet Earth podcast. You can find it via Planet Earth online or on our website at thenakedscientist.com slash planet earth. Reacting to the world's best science, The Naked Scientists. You're listening to The Naked Scientist with me, Dave Ansell, and with Ben Valsler. Now, let's return to this week's topic, looking at the science that can be done using the ISIS neutron and muon source. Now, we've heard how ISIS can be used as a type of microscope to image the positions and dynamics of atoms, but it's also ideal for seeing how neutrons themselves interact with systems. Neutrons can actually be a problem. They can damage sensitive electronic circuits and interact with computer systems. A new target station at ISIS allows real components to experience many years' worth of neutron impacts in just a few seconds, as Dr Chris Frost explained. The the problem is, is that it's raining, and it's not the rain that you and I normally see, which is water, it's neutrons. And these neutrons come from cosmic rays that hit the top of the atmosphere and generate through particle reactions and nuclear reactions. By the time it gets down to ground level or the human occupation level, what we see is a gentle rain of neutrons. Now, humans and animals have evolved in this, so while it does damage to us, it damages our DNA, we have mechanisms that repair it. The trouble is that the electronic systems that we now rely on for all our everyday lives haven't evolved in the neutron rain, and so... They get damaged, but they can't repair it. So we have to learn how to do that repairing for them. What sort of damage actually occurs? Are we talking about breaks in wires, or are we talking about a more subtle general corrosion? It's, it's much more subtle than that. It's, it's to do with a nuclear reaction. So the subatomic particle, the neutron, collides with silicon atoms in these devices, and that causes charge to be dumped into the devices. Charge is the thing that makes electronics work. And so if you put charge in the wrong place through these nuclear reactions, then you get things happening that you don't want in your electronic devices. A nice example is in 2003 in Schoenberg in Belgium when an electronic voting machine added 4,096 more votes to one of the candidates. And, you know, I quite like to say neutrons can change governments, but it was in fact a local election, and so they worked out that there was something wrong, really because there were more votes than there were people, so they worked out, in fact, it couldn't have happened. And they traced this back to a neutron. So a neutron effectively voted in a local election in Belgium uh, through this neutron rain idea. How widespread a problem really is it? It's all over the world. The, the, the neutrons are generated through cosmic rays, and these cosmic rays are, are from the galactic source. They're, they're not the ones that come from the sun. They're pretty much constant. They've been constant for millennia, and it's constant day and night all over the world. There is a slight variation due to the magnetic field of the Earth, but it's a problem worldwide, and it's a problem associated with pretty much all of the electronic industry. Of course... 
the ones that the, the, the biggest problem are the critical electronic systems. So examples of that are flight systems on aircraft. As you go up in the atmosphere, it's 300 times greater at flight altitudes than at ground level. And if you think about that, what that means is if you were to see something go wrong once a year on the ground, you'd see it go wrong once a day at flight altitudes. So where this emerged first really was in the aerospace industry, but the sky is falling. And what I mean by that is that electronic systems on the ground are increasingly seeing these effects as well, both in critical systems and in ones that we rely on every day. In the course of our lives, if you do banking, if you go on the internet, if you do almost anything in your life, you're interacting with electronic devices. And if those electronic devices go wrong, it can be inconvenient in the worst possible case. It can cause injury. So what actually are you doing here at ISIS? Well, what we're able to do is that we have a neutron source and that neutron source, thankfully, we can mimic the, uh, the spectrum of neutrons. And what I mean by is that the neutrons don't come in at one energy, they come in at all sorts of energies and they come in at different numbers across that energy spectrum, as we call it. And so what we're able to do here is to mimic what the spectrum looks like uh, with neutrons on the ground, so we can mimic that the way that it exists in nature. The difference is that we can accelerate it, and we can accelerate it somewhere between a million and a hundred million times. But what that means in reality is if you come and put your electronic device in our beam line for, say, an hour, then you can end up the equivalent of something like hundreds of years in the real environment. So we do a thing called accelerated testing, and from that we can work out how susceptible it is, and from that work out ways in which we can correct the faults in those electronic devices and make them safe. So essentially you'll see how often these devices fail, and that can tell you how likely they are to go wrong in the real world. You then must tally that up to how long their operating life would be anyway, and therefore you can tell whoever your client is that this thing will be safe to use in the wild for 10 years or whatever it may be. Yes, that's exactly right. And not only that, it can tell you, A, whether you need to correct it, because some devices might not be actually susceptible, or their susceptibility means that, you know, for instance, on a phone, it might fail once every three years, in which case you don't care. But if it was to fail every 10 minutes, you would care. So in, in that case, you might decide that actually it's worthwhile in your development stage of your phone to put correction mechanisms for this event that goes on into your phone. That will cost you money to do that because it takes time for the software programmers and the engineers to design it in. So it tells you not only that it could fail, but it tells you how often it fails, and it can also tell you how you're going to correct for it or even if it's worth it. So there's a great deal of commercial value to uh, people who produce things that we use every day. What sorts of industries do you think are likely to uh, knock on your door? We've already had them knocking on our door and the kinds of industries are pretty much anybody that produces electronic devices where at the moment failure will cost them either in safety issues, so that would be, say, the aerospace industries, or in commercial issues. And examples of that are people who build the servers and the connections that build up the internet. So if you have a business that relies on a server, the person who sells you that server wants to tell you that that's a very reliable server. So people will come along and test those servers or the devices in those servers to make sure they work correctly. And how can you protect from this neutron rain? Well, it's a thing called hardening by design. That's a bit of a, a mouthful. But what it means is that you will put in redundancy, so you'll build many circuits and all of them run at the same time and they can vote on which one's the best or else you put things that constantly check to see whether errors are occurring. That increasingly becomes difficult as electronics gets more complicated. The kinds of errors we're seeing and, and the way that they propagate through the system is changing and so we have to stay ahead of the game and test and make sure that it works properly. So you're not just recommend that everybody keep their servers in a lead-lined room in order to keep them safe? Yeah, unfortunately, a lead-lined room won't do anything. The neutrons are so energetic they go straight through lead. So you can't protect by burying them in the ground unless you go a long way into the ground. So what you have to do, you have to do this hardening by design. You have to think about it very carefully. You have to understand what's going on. And then you design within your circuitry, within your software, within all the firmware and the way that it works to pick up the errors and correct them. Dr Chris Frost, the project leader of Chip Irradiation Research at ISIS. Now, the final stop on this week's tour of ISIS shows us how it also has a lot to contribute to the study of biological systems. In fact, ISIS has been used to shed light on how a naturally produced antibacterial protein gets into cells of E. coli. 
To find out more, I met Dr Luke Clifton from ISIS, along with Stephen Holt, and firstly Anton Lebrun from the Bragg Institute at the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation. We have a, a toxin that's called colosin N. It's produced by E. coli to kill competing E. coli cells. So when the, the E. coli cells in nature are under stress, such as um, there's a lack of nutrients to control the population, the E. coli will produce this toxin to, to kill off the competing cells so that there's enough nutrients to go around. And the problem that we were looking at was... E. coli are what we call gram-negative bacteria, which means they have a double membrane. How does this toxin cross the outer membrane to get to the inner one? It uses proteins in the outer membrane to do this. So we were looking at how does this toxin bind to the receptor protein and then cross that outer membrane. So this is a, a natural antibiotic, and you're trying to work out how it works. Ultimately, what would be the point? Why do we need to know how it actually gets into the cell? A number of reasons. So in a membrane is what we call like a hydrophobic barrier. It kind of prevents things that we don't want to get into our cells, like toxins and poisons and stuff, getting in. And so one aspect of the research is how do things cross this hydrophobic barrier in general? And also as well, it's looking into how large antimicrobial agents kill cells as well. How are they transported across membranes so that in the future we can manipulate this process to, to make better antimicrobial agents? Why do you need to use a, a neutron source like ISIS for this? Why can't we just look at these cells under a microscope and try and observe what's happening? Hi, I'm Stephen Holt. Well, we can certainly look at them under a microscope and we can observe physically say what's happening to them that you could you know, see their shape change you could see that they've toxin has been effective but you don't know how they're doing it so what we want to do is we want to get down to the more molecular level and get that detail so with light you're restricted in the resolution and in other aspects as well such as determining different proteins you just can't do that directly yeah, perhaps with some fluorescent tags you could but then once again you don't have the resolution that's really required. So we decided to use neutrons to do this, to get down to that molecular level and just try and see what each individual component was doing. I'm sure you're all aware that um, water is made up of H2O, hydrogen and oxygen. Neutrons will interact with hydrogen in one particular way and the real strength is that if you use deuterium, as opposed to hydrogen, so that's an isotope of hydrogen. You can have D2O, so-called heavy water, and neutrons will interact with that very, very differently. And then you can do the same thing with your protein. You can replace some of the hydrogens, or all of the hydrogens, if possible, with deuterium. So it's like tagging one of the proteins for neutrons. And so then we're able to see the two different proteins as very different entities. When we do this to them, we can pick them out individually and that enables us to locate them within the complex or within the membrane that we're looking at and to determine how one is moving, say, from the solution into the film. Does it move all the way in? Does it move part of the way in? Where is it located? And we could see a very strong difference between when we've got the membrane protein there and when it's not there, the toxin ended up in a very different position relative to the membrane. Luke, what are you actually doing with ISIS in order to see these interactions? Well, for this particular piece of work, we did uh, use two of the uh, techniques we have available at ISIS. One was uh, small-angle neutron scattering, which allows us to uh, examine the uh, low-resolution structure of particles in solution, and the other was um, neutron reflectometry, which allows us to analyse the structure of surfaces. Small-angle neutron scattering is particularly useful in looking at the structure and structural changes of proteins in solution, whereas uh, neutron reflectometry is good at looking at the uh, structure of uh, model biological membranes and interactions with these. I assume their names give you a clue as to what's actually happening. So the small angle scattering involves seeing what happens when you aim the neutrons at a very acute angle and see how they scatter, whereas the reflectometry involves looking at how they bounce off. That's correct, yeah. <laughs> what have you actually found out about this protein? How is it getting into those cells and doing its antibiotic work? The amount of the toxin protein that went into the film just 
but it's, there's just no way that can be sitting inside this iron channel, which is usually used just to enable individual ions, you know, chlorine, etc., to come in and out of cells. There was just no way that we could have stuffed that amount of protein inside these channels. It just wasn't physically possible. So then we figured the only thing that would be happening is it's sitting on the outside. And so then when the small angle neutron scattering work was done, the structure, the low resolution structure that came out for the complex very clearly showed that the collison is actually going up between the membrane protein and the lipids in which it's sitting in its and it's not completely unfolding and going through this iron channel, but it's actually going around the outside and not having to unfold and perturb its structure as strongly as it would do if it went the other way. So it seems to be taking advantage of a, a weakness between a membrane protein and the membrane itself, and that's how it, it sneaks through. Whether you call it a weakness, I'm not sure, because it's clear that if you just add any protein into the presence of E. coli, it doesn't go through that barrier. So there's still something very special about the way that collison N can go through there. So this is not a general transport route. It's specific to this particular protein. And then if we can understand some of that specificity, then that perhaps is a way to begin to attack bacterial cells. Stephen Holt from the Bragg Institute and before him Luke Clifton from ISIS and fellow Bragg Institute member Anton Lebrun. This is The Naked Scientist with Ben Valsler and me, Dave Ansell. We're joined in the studio this week by Professor Martin Dove from Queen Mary University of London. We've just got a few minutes left to take on your questions and possibly we'll start off with this one from Sally. Um, He's wondering what the lifetime of fundamental particles like protons, electrons and neutrons are. Okay, so protons and electrons, as far as we're concerned in our lifetime, last forever. Neutrons last for just under 15 minutes if they're on their own. Now, to do an experiment, actually the experiments we do with neutron scattering uh, take place, you only need them to last for, for less than a second, so that's not an issue. But you can actually capture neutrons, put them in something like a little bottle, they last for just under 15 minutes. If you have a neutron that's actually part of a nucleus, then it effectively lasts forever. But on its own, just under 15 minutes. So being inside that nucleus is somehow stabilising yeah, it, making yeah. it last a lot. Yeah, longer. absolutely. Excellent. So it's good to know that they do stick around for long enough to do some good science with. Martin, one question I had was, uh, in your previous life as a professor of earth sciences, I always think of earth sciences as being about continents and being about rocks and big things, volcanoes. How were you using ISIS to answer those sorts of questions? Well, the way the earth works depends upon the properties of the materials that make up the earth. So much of the inner earth is made up of of different sorts of silicates and then you come up to the crust and you have many more different types of of minerals. And uh, ISIS, neutron source, excellent for understanding the properties, uh, the structure of these materials. One of the things that you can do with neutrons, which is which is uh, really very helpful, is that you can you can do experiments where you put the sample under both high pressure and high temperature, and what you can do with neutrons, because neutrons tend to need quite large samples, is you have a very large sample, but what you're able to d- achieve is actually a very good distribution of temperatures and pressures across the sample so that it isn't as if the sample is cold at the outside, hot in the middle, and uh, you get a a big range. In fact, it's really quite good. So this is so you can understand how a material would work under the immense pressures and temperatures deep inside the Earth, which we wouldn't know about otherwise. Yeah, that's right. You you can understand exactly how it compresses, where the atoms move to when it compresses, if some of the the processes inside the, the mineral cause it to change shape the bonding changes you can see all of that so it gives us a more realistic picture basically by being able to interact with the physical properties as well as actually just having a look at the structure yeah that's right because things like how how stiff the material is depends upon where uh, the atoms are in relationship to each other that's exactly what we're learning We've had a tweet from Robert Petit. He's tweeted at Naked Scientist. And he asks if you can see or accurately visualise subatomic particles or if we only know about them by the maths or the inference. Now, neutrons, of course, are a subatomic particle. So can you see smaller than a neutron? Well, you can see uh, you can see a nucleus, and the nucleus of a hydrogen atom is a proton, which is the same. Uh, you can't see below that, with uh, at least with the sorts of neutrons that ISIS produce, but you can see down to the level of the proton. 
And now, getting out of this world in her search for peace and quiet, here's Hannah Critchlow with her Question of the Week. The Naked Scientist's Question of the Week, brought to you in association with the How to Wisman Foundation, supporting science and education, from Alpha to Omega. This week, we find out if it might be true that on Mars, no one can hear you scream, with a question from one of our listeners. Hi, Naked Scientist. Jody from Plymouth here. I have a question about Mars. If Mars has a much less dense atmosphere than that of Earth, does that mean that sound waves travel slower on that planet than it does our own? Thanks. First up, we crack into some calculations. In general, the speed of sound is proportional to the square root of a substance's stiffness, divided by its density. Since Mars's atmosphere has a lower density than here on Earth, you'd expect the speed of sound to be faster than here on Earth. But... If you reduce the pressure of a gas, the stiffness also reduces, so the speed of sound should stay about the same on Mars as it is on Earth. But there's another factor to consider. Mars is further away from the Sun. How does this affect the speed of sound? Over to an expert. My name is Catherine Conley and I am the NASA Planetary Protection Officer. The difference is temperature. If you reduce the temperature of the atmosphere, the speed of sound does get slower. So, in fact, the speed of sound on Mars is about two-thirds of the speed of sound on Earth. So, say two humans were to land on Mars, given the slightly lower speed of sound there, could they still speak to each other? A listener got in touch with his thoughts. Hello, this is Evan Stanbury from Sydney, Australia. The speed of sound on Mars is around 240 metres a second, a bit lower than the 340 metres a second on Earth. By itself, that wouldn't make sound communication harder. However, the atmospheric density of Mars is less than 1% of Earth, almost a vacuum by our standards. This means that sound attenuation is much greater, and so speech wouldn't carry very far. Human mouths and ears would not be able to couple sound efficiently into or out of the thin Martian atmosphere, so humans would be effectively deaf. So, yes, the speed of sound is slower on Mars, largely due to the cold temperature there. And the atmosphere's lower density isn't suited to human speech and hearing systems, which have evolved for life on Earth. Instead, radio waves, a form of light, travels fine through low densities, so it can be used as a method of communication up there. Which is how exploratory rovers on Mars, like Curiosity, communicate, not with each other, but with us on Earth, using radio wave messages travelling at the speed of light and taking about 15 minutes to be received here on Earth. Thanks, Jodie, for getting in touch with that great question and Evan and Cassie for answering. Next up, we ask, can we make a real-life Spider-Man? Enriquez got in touch with this question. If we put the DNA from a spider into a human, what would happen? So, can you successfully mix spider and human DNA? And what could you create, if so? What do you think about that one? Let us know by posting on our Naked Scientist Facebook page, tweet at Naked Scientists, email chris at thenakedscientists.com, or you can join in the debate on our forum, which is at nakedscientists.com slash forum. That was Hannah Critchlow. And that is all that we actually have time for this week. Many thanks to Martin Dove from QMUL for joining us in the studio this week and to Jennifer and Dove for tweeting at us earlier that she was listening to her dad on the Naked Scientist radio show. Thanks for listening, Jennifer. So next week we're going to dive into the oceans to discover how marine protected reserves could help to maintain fish stocks and preserve threatened marine ecosystems. Keep sending in your questions and comments to chris at thenakedscientist.com and this week's show is produced by Hannah Critchlow and Tom Simpkins. The Naked Scientists podcast comes to you from Cambridge University and is supported by the Wellcome Trust, the EPSRC, the STFC, the Natural Environment Research Council and UK Fast. For more cutting-edge science, join us online at nakedscientists.com.